Thank you for joining us today in worship. We're glad that you're here. My name's Pastor Al. The church is Mon Olive Lutheran Church, and it's actually more of a family, a family under God, under Christ. What are we as a church? We are about three things, seeking Jesus. So we're going to open up the Bible, which is the Word of God, and Jesus is called the Word of God. We're going to seek Jesus there. When we learn about him and about ourselves in the Word of God, we're going to share that with other people, sharing his love. But then also God calls us to build community. He's made us to be relational. We need each other, especially as Christians today. If you're new here at Mount Olive, or if you've been with us a long time, please feel free to go online at mountolivestpaul.org slash connect, and you can make a connection with us there. Whether you've got a question or you want to get in a group or you need some resources, please go online there and make that connection. Also, you can go to the Show More tab right underneath this video, and in there you'll find the digital bulletin for today's worship service. We're in a series called Be Church. And in these very strange times, difficult times, I don't know what you even want to call them anymore. This is not normal. We need to know how we can be church. And church, by biblical definition, is people gathered around the word of God. How can we continue to be church at these times that are very different from what we're used to? The book of Acts gives us great insight in different accounts of how the New Testament believers, the fledgling church, very small church, very small group of individuals, started to grow and expand both internally and externally as God's word and God's spirit filled them up. Today we're going to look at the Apostle Paul's life and an instance where he is called to trust. An example that also allows us to see in our difficult times, how can we trust that Jesus is the central figure of history, and he has the church's best interest in mind. So we'll look at that in Acts chapter 24. Again, the topic is trusting. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we trust that you are King of all kings and Lord of all lords. You set up powers and you tear them down at the proper time. Support us in the fight to trust to believe that all matters of social, civil, and global nature are in your governance. Keep our faith strong to the end. Bless us at these times of uncertainty. In your name, Jesus, we have been given the ability to pray. Thank you. Hear our prayer, Lord, and encourage us by your Holy Spirit. Amen. When we open up the Bible, it's only natural that we're going to find things that set our teeth on edge, that challenge us, that challenge our, our heart, our personality. They're going to show dark sides of who we are, things that we don't want to see, but we need to see them. And when we see them, God offers us an opportunity to confess them to him, but also to each other. We're going to use this prayer today. Let's pray this prayer together and confess our sins. Lord Jesus, it is not an easy thing for us to trust you implicitly. Our hearts are afraid to trust you completely. Release us from our fears, reduce our anxiety, and allow us to be comfortable with you in control. Give us the joy of reflecting on your ascension to the throne of God in heaven so that we do not grow weary or lose heart. Forgive all our mistrust and all our wanderings. Amen. Jesus lived a perfect life so that he could give you his perfect record. You need it. Jesus died an innocent death and shed his blood as payment for every sin, every dark thought. We need that as well. And then Jesus' resurrection confirms that the payment for all of our sin was taken place. Because of that, I can say to every one of you, you are forgiven in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The book of 1 John chapter 1 says this, The blood of Jesus, God's own Son, purifies us from all sin. All sin. Trust and believe. 
because our culture does not want us to believe in God anymore, because the circumstances of our life challenges challenge us to think, is God really listening? Is God really in control? And because Satan himself does not want us to believe that God has our best interest in mind, we are going to look at this next song that tells us to be still. Be still, my soul. The Lord is on your side. So let's sing this together with our worship team. Yeah. 
Let's seek Jesus by looking to the word of God. Our first reading is from the Old Testament book of Habakkuk, chapter 1. And Habakkuk is asking a great question. God, what are you doing? Uh, He does not understand how all of what he sees fits into God's plan. And God responds to Habakkuk. We may not understand what God is doing today. God also would respond to us, I have my plan. You are in my plan. Habakkuk chapter 1. The prophecy that Habakkuk the prophet received. How long, Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen or cry out to you? Violence, but you do not save. Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. Therefore, the law is paralyzed and justice never prevails. The wicked hem in the righteous so that justice is perverted. Sounds like modern day. Listen to God's response. Look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed. For I am going to do something in your days that you would not believe, even if you were told. I am raising up the Babylonians, that ruthless and impetuous people, who sweep across the whole earth to seize dwellings not their own. They are a feared and dreaded people. They are a law to themselves and promote their own honor. God is saying, I've got control. I control all authority, kings and princes and armies. I'm in control. Same in Habakkuk day as in Habakkuk's day as it is in our day. Remember that, especially in this political year. Our epistle reading... An epistle is a letter. This particular letter was written by Paul to the Roman believers. And it's the quintessential verse for knowing that Jesus is the central figure of all history, for trusting that and trusting that he has a plan for you personally. Romans 8, 26 to 28. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. Thank God for that. The Spirit, if you're unable to pray appropriately, if if you don't know what to pray for, the Spirit can intercede. So just pray. Just pour out your heart to God and the Spirit will cause your prayer to be parallel with the word of God. And here's that verse that is so valuable to us. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. God works for the good. He is actively working in our life for the good. He is the central figure in our life. Our reading from Matthew chapter 11, even some of the greats, like John the Baptist, had doubts that God was working. Here, John the Baptist is in prison, and he's kind of scratching his head at first, but then he seems to be in a quandary. Uh, God, did you forget me? Why am I here in prison? In fact, the the, the book of Matthew records that John the Baptist never got out of prison. He literally lost his head. Is God still in control? Let's listen to these words from Matthew chapter 11. After Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in the towns of Galilee. When John, who was in prison, when he heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to ask him, Are you the one who is to come? Or should we expect someone else? Most commentators say he had doubts, and I believe it too. He's human. We look at the situation around us, we have doubts. God, did you forget me? Did you forget what's going on? Jesus replied, go back and report to John what you see and hear. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. So Jesus gives an answer by going back to the predictions in the Old Testament about who the Messiah would be. And he says, look, I'm doing it. I'm doing everything the Old Testament said I would do. That's where we take our confidence. Look back to the word of God. Then our reading for today, for the sermon, Acts chapter 24. 
Then Felix, who was well acquainted with the way, the way is another term for Christianity. It's, it's what Christians were first called or called early on in the book of Acts. They were called the way. Instead of being called Christians, they were called the way because Jesus called himself the way, the truth, the life. So his followers were called the way. Then Felix, who was well acquainted with the way, with Christianity, adjourned the proceedings. When Lysias, the commander, comes, he said, I will decide your case. He ordered the centurion to keep Paul under guard, so he's in prison, but to give him some freedom and permit his friends to take care of his needs. Several days later, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish. He sent for Paul and listened to him as he spoke about faith in Christ Jesus. As Paul talked about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and said, That's enough for now. You may leave. When I find it convenient, I'll send for you. At the same time, he was hoping that Paul would offer him a bribe, so he sent for him frequently and talked with him. So there's something that intrigued him, but he was not intrigued so much by the faith that Paul shared. He was intrigued by the opportunity to make some money off of Paul. When two years had passed, Felix was succeeded by Porcius Festus. But because Felix wanted to grant a favor to the Jews, he left Paul in prison. This is the word of our Lord. Let's pray, and I'll share what God has put on my heart for us today. Heavenly Father, we still want to be church, and, and even as we pass through this series. We want to be the kind of people you've called us to be. And, and a big part of that comes down to trust, to look around at the world that we're in and trust that you are the central figure of history, to look around the world where we're at and trust that you have your fingers in all of political and economic and, and every type of movement that's going on in our world. You're not out of control, you're in control. You haven't forgotten about us. We are in your sights every day. So Lord Jesus, please help us to trust that. Help us to trust you as life moves forward, good, bad, or indifferent. Ultimately, help us to trust you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So as, as we get going, I want us to consider a few things. One of one of my favorite apologists, favorite preachers, is a man by the name of Ravi Zacharias. He's now in heaven. He died just a few weeks ago. And I've been listening to him a lot lately. One of the things he said in a recent, in, in, in one of his, it's not recent anymore, but in one of his podcasts was titled this, Convictions That Conquered the World. Convictions That Conquered the World. And he was speaking about the New Testament church in the book of Acts. Here's what he said. They saw the finger of God in all of history and Christ as its central figure. They saw the finger of God in all of history, even their own history, and Christ as its central figure. So I put that to you today. Do you see the finger of God in all of history, the history of the Twin Cities as we're in the midst of a pandemic, but also social injustice and, and upheaval and po politics, crazy politics, and all kinds of gender issues and sexual issues. Do you see the finger of God in all of history and Christ as its central figure? Today in Acts chapter 24, we're going to look at how Paul sees the finger of God in all of history and Christ as its central figure. But I also want to give you an illustration that, that may help you with understanding how God does work in all of history. About the time of Napoleon, back in the late, 18, late 1700s, early 1800s, Alexander Pavlovich watched his father murdered, butchered. His father was afraid of people. He was hated by the men and by people in Russia, so much so that he knew he had to build himself a fortress with 15 foot walls. But even though it was such a powerful dominating fortress, 
60 men found their way into that fortress and murdered Alexander's father. So at the age of 24, Alexander Pavlovich became the czar of Russia. Well, he wanted to be a good man. He didn't want to be like his father. So he started out on a, on a decent note and then eventually was married. And after his marriage, he quickly decided adultery was the course of his life. Licentious living. And yet there was a problem, the Archbishop of Russia. So when an opportunity came to put a new Archbishop in place, he picked a man who was equally as licentious as himself. And he thought, this is great. I'm going to have someone in the church who has the same attitude as me, and I can get along with my adulterous, non-God-pleasing living. I can buck what God says and do my own thing. He thought he had it set. But God has his finger in all of history, and Christ is its central figure. God had another plan. So the archbishop was put in place. This man who had a, a lifestyle and an attitude just like Alexander. But God converted him, brought him into the faith. Now, instead of an advocate, Alexander's got an enemy in the church. So he tries, to, he tries to dominate the church, and he wants to obliterate the church. Problem is, Napoleon is marching against the Russians at this time. So, so Alexander Pavlovich uh, gains his, uh, gathers his army together, 130,000 troops armed to the teeth, and he brings them into Poland to fight Napoleon, but he's slaughtered, and he has to run for his life. He runs back to Moscow, and eventually, down the road, Napoleon comes and marches into Russia and marches toward Moscow. He's looking for the Tsar. He's looking for Tsar Alexander. He gets to Moscow, and in search of Tsar Alexander, he burns building after building after building, and much of Moscow is on fire, but they can't find the Tsar. Where's the Tsar? The Tsar ended up in St. Petersburg. He ended up in St. Petersburg, and in St. Petersburg, with Napoleon's army chasing him down, with the church against his licentious behavior, he finally realized, I need to give in to the God of history and its central figure, Christ. So he got down on his knees and begged for forgiveness. God had humbled him. He begged for forgiveness and asked for God's mercy, please help me, somehow help me out of this. I know 130,000 troops can't fight Napoleon. Lord, please help. I know I can't fight your church. Lord, please help. And he begged for God's mercy. He begged for his forgiveness. He begged for his help. You know what God did? He sent in winter early that year. And Napoleon and his army was rebuffed. In fact, Napoleon and his army had to run, literally, for their life back to Paris. God's finger is in all of history, and Christ is its central figure. Paul believed that. Do you and I believe that? Let's look at the words from Acts chapter 24, and let's see where the Apostle Paul is at with this topic. Then Felix, who was well acquainted with the way, adjourned the proceedings. Just to catch you up to speed, Paul has Paul's head is marked. People want him dead. The Jews want him dead, and they put a price on his head. And, and it's an interesting situation where they tried to kill him. There was a plot against him, but the authorities, the Roman authorities, took Paul into prison, took, imprisoned him to keep him safe. Now he's gone from Jerusalem, where the plot started. He's in Caesarea Maritima, which is on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea, beautiful place. He's locked down there, and these Jews are coming to accuse him of certain things, certain crimes, because they want him dead. So if they can't do it by a plot, they're going to do it, try to do it legally. They want him dead. So Paul's in the middle of all of this. And you've got to wonder, as Paul is in the middle of all of this intrigue where he's being wrongfully accused, he knows it. Is he wondering, is he trusting that God has his finger in all of history and Christ is still its central figure? 
Well, we're going to see it in how Paul reacts. But I want you to consider these few things. Why might trusting be an issue for the Apostle Paul at a time like this? <clears throat> well, there are a few reasons why. First, Felix. Felix is a historical figure. You can go look Felix up. You can find out about Felix and see what kind of a character he is. Tacitus, one of the, uh, the, the ancient historians, said of Felix, he said, he indulged every kind of barbarity and lust. Felix was not a good guy. In fact, his second wife, he stole from another man. So he was an adulterer on top of it. He committed adultery. He was uh, full of, of lust and barbarity. He created an atmosphere in Judea that was torturous for people to live in. It was so nasty. And, and he was very good at stirring up political problems. He was not a good ruler. So Paul is in a political realm that is very corrupt. That's one reason he might have trouble trusting that God has his finger in all of history. Does that sound in any way familiar with what we're living in? Can you trust the left? Can you trust the right? Can you trust the power that's in, in play in this particular position? What about the Supreme Court? What about the governor? What about the president? What about the Senate? Are we not in a similar situation today? And can we still trust that God has his finger in all of history and Christ is a central figure. Paul did. Paul saw this not as a threat. Paul saw this as an opportunity. So the political situation was very dangerous. Second, I already mentioned, Paul was marked for death. That's a reason to not trust. When is it that we as Christians might be marked for death? We're not now. We're, we're supposedly in a free, a religiously free nation so far. But that's an unusual thing in history. Will we ever be in a position where we are also marked for death? Like our other Christian brothers and sisters throughout the world, in China, in Indonesia, in various parts of the world, in Burma. Are we like our Christian brothers and sisters who are literally marked for death? And can we at that point trust that God has his finger in all of history and Christ is its central figure. So the political situation was difficult physically for Paul, that his life was on the line. That was very difficult. But also there's something emotionally that's, that's wearing on Paul. He doesn't know where this is all going. It's been two years, two years he was in prison and was going to keep going on from there. This kind of stuff can wear you down after a while. How long is this going to go? And if it goes longer than I expect, is Christ still the central figure of all of history? Is his finger still working in history for the good of his church? That's just natural. Again, let's see how Paul reacts. Felix was well acquainted with the way he adjourned the proceedings. Lysias, the commander, comes, another historical figure. You can look him up and find out more about him. This guy is actually better politically. He's a better individual than Felix. Then I'll decide your case. <clears throat> he ordered the centurion to keep Paul under guard, but to give him some freedom, permit his friends to take care of his needs. Several days later, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla. Now we'll come back to these two. Th these are the adulterers. These are the ones Paul is going to stand in front of. Now let's see, does he trust that God has his finger in all of history and Christ as its central figure? As Paul talked about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, here's where we get to the real crux of our message, the, the, the place where we see that Paul does trust that God has his finger in, in all of history and Christ is its central figure. Why? Three words, righteousness, self-control, and judgment. Righteousness, it's a, a good church word, but what does it mean? You could say it means right behavior. That works. There is a right and a wrong behavior in life. Even the secular world around us recognizes there's a right and there's a wrong. Where do we get that from? That comes from God. But ultimately, we have to, we have to figure out who is the ultimate authority. Who is the one that finally decides what is right or wrong? The Bible says it's God. That's righteousness. 
In other words, is this acceptable to God? Is this condition acceptable to God? What does that look like? Well, I've often rented from a local renting company, rental firm, you know, some kind of tools, uh, a nice saw for cutting through um, block masonry or stone. I've rented chainsaws from this particular rental company. I'm going to rent uh, like a small skid steer from them. And when I return it to them, I need to return it in a condition acceptable to the owner. I can't return it in a condition acceptable to me. Like, well, it's dirty, it's broken, it's, it's marred, it's scratched. No, I have to return it in a condition that's acceptable to them. Who's the owner? According to righteousness, according to the biblical teaching on righteousness, God has his finger in all of history. Christ is its central figure. I'm responsible to God. And I'm going to talk about three things that we're responsible for. Responsible for my body. Responsible for the lives of other people. Responsible for how I've treated God. So, responsible for to God for a, I have to have a condition acceptable to God when I consider how I've treated my body, how I've treated others, and how I've treated God. That means God decides what sexual unions are good and which ones are evil. Not me. Not me. This is not on the Christian church to decide if sex between a man and a woman is acceptable outside of marriage. It's not on the Christian church. It's on God. Go back. I, I need to go back to scriptures and see, is a sexual union or unions multiple is that acceptable to God? Look in scriptures. Search out scriptures. What else about myself? I need to see, I need to see what, did, what has God decided about my body, my gender? Not me. Am I living as God called me to live? I'm responsible to him. And I know that's not a popular message, but here's why. Here's why I have to bring it up. It's the truth of God. And Paul recognizes this too, because Paul is standing in front of a man who is living an adulterous, licentious life. Felix and his, his wife, his second wife, Drusilla who he stole from another man. He lured her away, coveted her, wanted her. She was a beautiful woman, and he stole her away. That's wrong. Paul is standing up and saying, there is someone that we are accountable to. He also addresses the topic of self-control. Am I able to live according to God's conditions? And then judgment. There is a day of judgment. There is a judgment day. And you know how Felix reacted? Felix was afraid and said, uh, I'm, I'm done. Don't want to listen to it. He didn't want to hear about a condition acceptable to God because he had violated it. Nobody wants to hear that, that my, my little white lies are not acceptable to God. Fudging on my taxes is not acceptable to God. Deciding on a different lifestyle than, than is God's wish is not acceptable to God. Nobody wants to hear that they are wrong. Nobody wants to hear that their thoughts about another woman when they're married to this woman are not acceptable to God. Nobody wants to hear that their lack of speaking up is not acceptable to God. All of these things can be found in scriptures. Do we want to hear the truth about righteousness, self-control, and judgment? Why was Paul able to stand up and talk about this? Because Paul was in the same boat. Notice what he said in verse 24. He sent for Paul and, and listened to him as Paul spoke about faith in Christ Jesus. Paul did not speak about performance. 
Paul did not come up in, in front of Felix and say, yeah, everything God demanded, I did. My self-control, perfect. Even the little stuff, I did it all. No, Paul stood up and, and said, faith in Christ Jesus. He said, I know someone who did this perfectly. I know someone who considered all the conditions acceptable to God, and he did them. His name is Christ Jesus. And I know my self-control is not good enough, but I know Jesus' self-control is. Jesus did everything that God asked him to do. And then the judgment. I know that I cannot stand under the judgment of God because as soon as I put one foot into the judgment stand, I'm guilty. I am guilty. Paul knew that too. But he had learned about faith in Christ Jesus, who underwent the judgment for every one of us, for every one of us who struggles with gender, for every one of us who struggles with sex, for every one of us who struggles with right and wrong, who struggles with truth, speaking the truth, telling the truth, thinking the truth. Every one of us who struggles with authorities, giving honor and glory to authorities. Because every one of us has a struggle. And the only way out for any of us is faith in Christ Jesus. Do you, like Paul, see the finger of God in all of history, even our history now in the cities? And do you see Christ as the central figure? In fact, let me just add this, the saving figure who wants to be your savior I know I need him. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, Paul locked up in prison under a filthy political system with a price on his head could have been in despair. But he knew that to live is Christ and to die is gain. He knew Christ as the central figure. And, and when that day came and his life was taken, you, Lord Jesus, brought him to be with you forever. <clears throat> to die is gain. While we are here on earth, Lord, help us to live for you, to live for Christ. And recognize you as the central figure in all of history. And give testimony to you as our Savior from sin. So that others who do not match the righteousness, the condition acceptable to God. Others can hold on by faith to that righteousness, the self-control and the judgment that has already been carried out on Christ for our sin. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please join with me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Receive the blessing of your heavenly Father. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look on you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. And recognize, too, that favor he wants to give. He wants to hand over that perfect record of Jesus because he knows your record is not good enough. And he wants to hand over that finished judgment that took place when Jesus died on the cross for your sin. That can be yours. That's the blessing he wants to give you. Thank you for joining us in worship. We encourage you that uh, please go online at mountallofstpaul.org. If any part of this message has inspired you, encouraged you, feel free to click the icon and give back to this ministry. Also, keep looking for further insights. There is an email that you can receive. There's more information in the Show More tab underneath. And there's a link to uh, Mount Olive there if you'd like. Thank you for being here, everybody. God bless.